continuing Carly Gregg's murder trial. She killed her mother. This is the end of day two. Uh, this is Zachary Cotton. He is the investigator in the case. And so far, they've asked, they've talked about the swab that they took, and he initialed it, um, of Carly's right and left cheek. And they're fixing to get into, um, he was there for the autopsy. And let's, let's continue. Investigator Cotton, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, were you also, did you also close and seal evidence of swabs taken from the firearm used to kill Miss Smiley? That was not me. I believe that was Investigator Burnell did that. Um, may I approach the witness, Your Honor? Yes, Handing you two envelopes. Um, if you could take a look at those, both front and back. It's freezing up. Um, what are those two envelopes? They. Uh, this one says it's a uh, swab taken off of the trigger of the firearm, and this other one says it's a uh, swab from the hammer of the revolver. And do those both bear your initials as well? Yes, ma'am. Indicating that you do know what those are? Yes, ma'am. Um, and is that taken from the hammer and the trigger of the um, weapon used in this crime? Yes, ma'am. Your Honor, we'd ask that those be marked as the state's next exhibit. Any objection? No objection, Your Honor. That's 49 <clears throat> will be the swab of the hammer. They had a lot of audio problem between Court TV and Law and Crime on either audio or freezing. Uh, investigator Cotton, we've heard from um, two other officers, a deputy and investigator that were involved in this case, and so I, I certainly don't want to rehash what they've talked about. Thank God. Um, we've gotten, I think, through the point where uh, in the investigation where the crime scene was cleaned up, um, uh, or process, I'm sorry. The victim was taken out of the home, both the living and the deceased victim. Um, at, at some point, did you have the opportunity to observe an autopsy on Ashley Smiley? Yes, ma'am. It was approximately a week later. I believe it was on March 26th at the uh, Mississippi Crime Lab. May I approach, Your Honor? Handing you what's previously been marked as uh, 41 and 42 uh, for ID. If you could take a look. These are both uh, projectiles that were recovered from the uh, body of Ashley Smiley, um, one of which was recovered from her brain and the other which was recovered from the back of her neck. Oh and were God. you present when the autopsy was performed and those projectiles were removed? Yes, ma'am, I was. Um, and did you also seal that evidence? Um, I believe the crime lab sealed that one due to them being the one that actually recovered the projectiles. Um, but you were present when they were recovered? Yes, ma'am. We'd ask that those be uh, marked uh, as an exhibit rather than ID at this time, Your Honor. Any objection? No objection, Your Honor. They'll be admitted for all purposes. Please hand them back to the court reporter. We mark 41 and 42 all purposes. Damn. The back of the head and in right, one in the brain. Jeez. Carly just sitting there with us. 
stupid ass dates on her face. And Investigator Cotton, who all did you witness, or who all did you, uh, I guess, interview in this case? Okay, here comes the defense. Wow. I don't know what he's going to ask him. I'm freshly going through this. <laughs> oh, my God. How is he going to discredit Mr. Cotton? How's he going to discredit him or find flaws in the evidence gathering? Or if somebody turned off a body cam footage? Well, let's find out. Man. Who else did he interview? I think that's what he asked him. Um, one of the uh, parties that was interviewed was uh, the friend that was over at the residence at the time Mr. Hiley, uh, Mr. Smiley was shot. And, and her initials would be the BW, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. And then um, as well as the, uh, the friend that was outside the residence that was located, uh, whose initials are BG. Okay. Um, I also spoke with... Uh, parents of some of the other juveniles that uh, Miss Gregg had attempted to contact on the date that this incident occurred. Damn. As well as Mr. Smiley. Okay. How many did she contact? And when you, I guess, you were at this, were you, you originally were the, the investigator who got the, I guess, a little SD drive, is, would that, SD card, would that be correct? The, the one that he provided to us went with the uh, initial garage footage? Yes. Is that one? Uh, yes, sir. Okay, so, and you were at the scene that night, the, when this takes place on the 19th? Uh, yes, sir, I went to the residence for a short period of time. And you helped with the investigator, and you're the lead investigator? Yes, sir, Investigator Burnell helped me with it. Okay, and so... You gathered all the info or all the evidence and information that you could on the 19th. Investigator Burnell did. I wasn't there for the processing of the scene. I left to go back to the office. Okay. And then when you, what did you do when you got back to the office? Um, we have a drying chamber up there that we can secure clothes and other evidence in there that uh, may either be saturated in blood or just water in general. Um, Miss Gregg's clothes, whenever she was booked in, were brought up there and placed in this drying chamber to dry out. Now, you're the person, I guess, who's in charge of, of, of gathering all the evidence for this case. Would that be correct? Uh, I assisted with it. I had other investigators assist me with it as well. Okay, but you're sort of the, you're the main guy in this case, so everything sort of comes to you. Would that be correct? Uh, yes, sir. Eventually, it would come back to me. Okay. And so you see all the videos, you know everything that's out there concerning this case, right? I would believe so, yes. Okay. Now, I know uh, at some point there, there's a video with, a, uh, I guess, a deputy stack? Oh, uh, Shaq? Shaq, I'm sorry, Shaq. Are, are you aware of that one? Yes, sir. Okay. And does Carly, Carly asks to see her mother on that video, doesn't she? Uh, I don't recall. Okay. What? Now, you and I guess you interviewed Heath, is that correct? Yes, sir, at a later date, not on the date that the incident occurred. Okay. At the when when you interview Heath, um, and this is I guess it's a couple days after, is that correct? I think it was approximately a week and a half. It was the very beginning of April. Okay. And he comes and sits down, and had he had you gotten the SD card by that at that time? <laughs> yes, sir. Okay. And so, because um, I noticed it said that you and his, and it was it was you, his attorney, and himself, and he had gotten an attorney based upon whatever happens with this SD card, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, you're asking him, you know, sort of why this happens or why this happened. Because this was not normal for, I mean, somebody just to uh, walk up and shoot their mother, correct? Especially if there's not a sort of a history or something, correct? Uh, I may have. I don't remember the specific question, but I, I may, may have an interview. Okay. And it's at that time where, and, and Heath doesn't really know, correct? No, correct. 
And so the next thing that happens is y'all start talking about, yes, yeah, she was in treatment and they had switched her medication. And he, I don't think he could tell you what it was, but you just had a general conversation. Yes, sir. Okay. And so that was the first time you learned that there may be psychological issues in this case. I think uh, that right there, him just mentioning um, they switched her medication. So are they going to have an expert on to talk about what happens when you switch the medication? Does it make people psychotic, suicidal, violent, this kind of thing? Wow. You think that's where he's going is... Uh, no gloves on. We heard the testimony earlier. Uh, body cams being shut off. Uh, find, trying to find faults in the the processing of evidence and evidence on the scene. Um, even even they brought up. Oh, did you had to when you showed up and they were all in the house? You had to tell them to secure the building. The house, secure the house. I say it's secure the building, but and here he just brought up. Are you aware they switched their medication? So I think these are the, the pinpoint things they're jabbing at to try to establish a why Carly did it because she hadn't had any signs of doing this, and the, and the stepdad don't know why she did it. So. I think that's the, they're just really working on that that foundation. But I don't know. That video they watched earlier was so powerful of her and the mom coming home and then her getting the gun and going and killing her was damn. Here we go. Now, we had just seen, there was a video, and I think it's a video you've been questioned about before, and it was, uh, I guess it's the video, it's the camera that was found, not the, not the little SD card, but the camera that was found in the refrigerator. You know what we're, what we're talking about with that camera? Yes, sir. Okay. And I think you've been questioned about it, and you said you can't tell what Miss Smiley, what room she's in, correct? Uh, you talking about Miss Ashley Smiley? Yes, Ashley Smiley. Yes. You do not know what room she's she's in. No, so I times. can't say for certain which room she's in. Yeah. And you can't tell anything that she was carrying or not carrying or anything. You were never able to identify. It, it's not. It's kind of the distance. It's not really discernible what exactly it is. She just had stuff in her hands at some points. And and I think your testimony would be from before is that. You didn't see them fighting or doing anything that was out of the ordinary before this incident happened, correct? Yes, sir. And I think you checked with the, did you check with the, her friends at school and everything to see if there was anything there that had caused problems? Uh, I spoke with uh, the BW and BG. Um, I know BG had mentioned that he had told Miss Smiley uh, prior to them leaving school that day that he had informed her of a... Uh, a phone that she wasn't supposed to have because uh, to my understanding she was in trouble already and had her phone her actual phone mm -hmm. taken away and had told her about uh, what he called weed pins that she had been using and uh, he said that he had told Miss Smiley that prior to her leaving school and going home with Miss Greg. And I, and I think he also had told you he didn't see anyone like Miss Smiley mad or anything like that when he left Miss Smiley, correct? Uh, I believe so. Okay. Well look, Think back on the video of Miss Smiley and Carly coming home. They go in, and it it appears that the mom just goes straight to Carly's room, pretty much. Carly kind of looks like, and rubbing her head and going back, she knows her mom is in her room. 
Now, they could have been having a conversation in the car on the way home, which I haven't heard being brought up. Of course, Carly, I don't know, I don't know if Carly's even brought it up to her defense attorneys or to the, or to the uh, law enforcement. She's informed about this before they leave school. They ride home together. So Carly's mom is aware. Oh, Car- this guy's telling her Carly's got a phone and got some weed pens. So they get in the car and come up. Now, thinking back at, at the video, that I think, I think they had a conversation. I don't know, with body language and stuff. Because her mom, they put stuff down. Carly's mom is, y'all, she's already all up in Carly's room. And Carly knows this. You didn't hear Carly going, well, hey, what you doing? Nothing. I, I'm just pointing that out. I, I, I'm i just speculating that it's a possibility her and Carly had a conversation on the way home that this that uh, she's been made aware you've got a phone in your room. And you've got some wee pins? What's up with that, you know? And then her mom comes home and then goes in her room. Just just wanting to point that out, that it just seemed like it. that's a good possibility. Now, on, I just a couple of questions. I was just wondering. Okay, BG, was a, he's a minor, correct? He's already testified. Yes. Okay, and you questioned him at, at the scene and also at the police station or just at the no, scene? No, sir, just, just at the scene. Okay, and did you, okay, did you get his parents' permission to do that before you did it? Uh, no, sir, he wasn't a suspect at the time, and his mother, right when I began speaking with him, actually walked up. I believe he had already called her. Okay. At some point, had y'all told, uh, I guess, told him and he had communicated to his mother that y'all were just taking him home? Objection or cause for speculation. Overruled as to what he told me. Yeah. Did you, te- did you tell BG that uh, y'all were just going to take him home? Uh, I do not recall. I, I, I don't remember saying that to him. I'm not sure if other deputies did. May I beg the court's indulgence for a moment, Your Honor? See, they trying to find, did he slip up in something? Did you talk to that boy without his mama? This. I think the only defense is, yeah, maybe the medication. And I just want to be clear. I think you, you've already, this, it's sort of going back to that camera. You had said, I think you've already said that you you couldn't tell if she if ashley smiling had been cleaning out a drawer like in the other room or something like that you had no idea what she was doing correct no sir she just appeared to be going over to that side of the residence where miss gray's room was and then coming out with items in her hand okay no further questions redirect examination wow and i think it's a result from the boy telling her that at the school now it's not the boy's fault that he's concerned about uh, Carly, but man, do you think he's asking himself if I wouldn't have never said anything when her mother's still being alive? I don't know. But I'm thinking at this point, there could be a defense of the medication that the doctors put her on, and then if they switched her medication, is that a possibility that it could have done something to her brain? Uh, by momentarily changing the character and things like that. Look, I'm not the, trying to defend Carly. I am just thinking out of the box of what the defense could use. Now, if there's parents out there watching this trial, I don't know. These go. You need to research these medications because, good Lord. Now, again... I haven't heard the anything from a doctor. I haven't heard anything from a psychiatrist. I don't know about stats. I don't even know what, what medication she was on or how long was she was on it, how many milligrams, what did they switch her to? Was it normal to switch her to somebody, something, something else? What's cause and effect? I, I'm against these kinds of medicines myself, um, but... 
The doctors, all of them, they want to make money. That's my opinion. I don't, you know. But then again, I, I've, I'll reiterate, I'm not a doctor, so, you know, I couldn't say, hey, don't give your kid that. That's a decision you have to make. She's just a bored, fidgety teenager. Damn. Mr. Gary Cotton, I'm handing you what's previously been marked as Exhibit 36 and 37. Do you recognize those photographs? Uh, yes, ma'am. Um, who's depicted in that photograph on the floor, deceased? Ashley Smiley. Damn. And whose room was that? Did you determine during your course of your investigation? It was Carly Gregg's room. Um, and in the course of your investigation, were there also other signs that the shooting had occurred in that bedroom? Uh, yes, ma'am. I believe there was some uh, blood spatter on the uh, the television that was in the room that was mounted on the wall as well as a, uh, there was a defect in the wall where one of the uh, projectiles had gone. Was there any evidence that any crime had occurred in the guest bedroom? No, ma'am, not that we found. Based on your investigation, the murder of Ashley Smiley occurred in what bedroom? In Miss Gregg's bedroom. And yeah. who murdered her? Uh, Miss Gregg. And based off your investigation, who attempted to murder uh, Heath Smiley? Miss Gregg. And based off your investigation, and we watched the video just a few moments ago, uh, who's the last person that was alive in the house when the camera goes out? Miss Gregg was. Uh, is it your understanding that she's the one that uh, removed the camera? Yes, ma'am. No further questions, Your Honor. Ms. Witness be finally excused by the state. Uh, so did you recall, Your Honor? You're, you're free to stand down, but you must leave the courtroom and you must not discuss your testimony with anyone else. So the defense examines him. I'm just trying. The only thing I could say that he laid down talking to him. I mean, hell, he had on the other detective for almost a, two hours, an hour and a half. The defense cross-examining him but this guy the only the only kind of foundation I think the defense was uh, laying was the medication I don't know I mean and, and then he mentioned about talking to the kid did you talk to him with the mom's permission did you ask if he if you if he needed a ride home I don't know I I'm just going to try to, you know, log that in. Like, is this going to go further? Were you opening up a door to go further down this rabbit hole that you're trying to chip away, the defense is trying to chip away at evidence, body cam, and then now, okay, the medication kind of thing. Did they do something wrong? I don't know. Nathan Holly is taking the stand. He is in forensics as well. And I kind of let it play through the um, his credentials. Okay, so he's been doing this with this for 17 years. And they dubbed him and ruled that he is an expert. So now she asked him a question. Uh, what is DNA? So he's fixing to school the jury on DNA. DNA first stands for deoxyribonucleic acid, and it's a molecule that's found within the cells of the human body. Um, and what DNA does is it tells the body how to build cells and also how to function and, and work those cells properly. Um, a person gets their DNA half from their mom and half from their dad, and it's that combination of those two separate DNAs that gives everybody, except for identical twins, a unique DNA profile. And when you do DNA testing, what are we talking about? What's done with our DNA? Sure. So uh, with the DNA testing, I'm looking at certain locations on that DNA molecule 
and there are forensic uh, tests that can determine what a person's DNA looks like at those locations. And um, I basically take items of evidence and I do the DNA process on those and then I take reference samples or known samples and then I compare those two DNA profiles to determine whether or not that person's DNA is there. And a known sample would be like if a swab was taken from my mouth, we would know that that was my sample. Is that right, right, right. It's a known or reference. Um, and then an unknown sample would be something that you would collect or that law enforcement would collect on a piece of evidence and send that to you? That's correct. Um, we just heard from Mr. Whitehead that the, um, the entire forensics laboratory, of course, is accredited. Uh, is the DNA section of the laboratory also, does that fall under the accreditation? Yes, it does. Uh, and do you follow proper protocol there? Yes, we do. Uh, have you personally uh, provided or undergone any proficiency testing? Yes. Uh, if you could explain that to the ladies and gentlemen. Um, so uh, for DNA, we're proficiency tested twice a year, and it's uh, from an outside uh, company. And basically, it is to for us to demonstrate that we are capable to do uh, the DNA process or our job. And um, so there's a correct answer for that, and um, they double check us on that. And your proficiency is up to date? Yes. Did you have the opportunity to work on a case at Mississippi Forensics Laboratory, case number 24-003524? Uh, Your Honor, may I refer to that? Yes, I did. May I perhaps, uh, in, in performing that uh, work, did you actually, uh, did you render a report? Yes, I did. <clears throat> may I approach the witness, Your Honor? Will be marked S52. Mr. Holly, before you can do any testing there at the crime lab, you have to receive certain pieces of evidence. Is that right? That's correct. Um, may I approach the witness, Sharon? previously been marked as exhibit 47, 48, 49, and 50. If you could start me with number 47, tell me what that is and how you know what that is. Uh, so this is a let's see it is a buckle swab of carly Gregg's left cheek um and it is i can identify it from the crime lab uh, barcode which has the uh, case number and submission number on it and did you uh is there also a uh buckle swab of her right cheek yes uh, and did you rely on that evidence in your testing in this case i did um, I also handed you uh, another item. Uh, looks like two additional swabs. Could you tell us what those were from? Sure. Uh, so one is a swab from a hammer of a Taurus revolver. And once again, I can identify it by the crime lab um, barcode that has a case number and submission number, as well as the evidence tape with my date and initial on it. And then the other one is a swab taken off of a trigger of the firearm. I guess I'm wanting to know is how close was Carly to her mother when she shot her in her bedroom? And did she shoot her from the back? Now, I know they said that there was, a, they, the, in the last testimony, there was a bullet found in the back of her head and one in her brain. Now, was she shot from the front? 
or was she shot from behind? Like Carly snuck up behind her, and how close was she? I mean, they can tell all that. That's why I'm I'm really curious, by the way, of did she just stand at the doorway and do it from across the room? And look, guys, it's a 357 Magnum. And the last forensic guy said there was uh, residue on both of her hands. So she was holding it with both hands, I guess, I'm assuming. I don't know. Inquiring minds want to know. Um, in performing DNA testing, uh, do you actually have to, well, can you describe for us, like you take an extract from something? Yes. Uh, so the DNA process starts with extraction. And what I'm doing uh, during the extraction is I'm actually removing the cells off of whatever substrate they're on, whether it's a swab or a cutting. And I'm lysing open that cell and getting rid of all the other cellular components except for the DNA. So the only thing that I'm left with is that isolated DNA. Uh, did you do that in this particular case? Yes, I did. So these would be the DNA extracts from my extractions on the items of evidence. And there's four total, but I just want to talk about, is there one for the um, swab from the trigger and then one from the swab of the hammer of a firearm? Yes, there are. Your Honor, we'd ask that that be marked as uh, state's next exhibit. Any objection? <clears throat> the dad said he grabbed the gun, so I and guess his DNA is going to be on there. Extract to the court order, the LBS 53. I'd assume it'd be on the barrel. And remember, his dad, her, her stepdad said he he didn't know if he caused the I'll second shot. The extracts in the same on the left. Uh, yes, I don't see how he could have okay. caused the second on shot. His finger would have had to been on the trigger. Well, he he said he grabbed the gun Is from her. The they tussled. Well, Just thought I'd point that out. So I was curious to see if, there, if there's going to be DNA of the stepdad on the weapon. There should be. He had it. Mr. Holly, the uh, report that you prepared, uh, did someone else review that work that you had done? Yes, they did. And did they agree with your findings? Yes, they did. And if you could tell us about the two items, I think I misspoke uh, earlier in this case when I said that there was a DNA match on the hammer. Um, could you tell us what your uh, findings were with regards to um, the hammer, the swab from the hammer on the Taurus gun? Uh, <clears throat> due to an insufficient amount of genetic information, no comparable results were obtained for the swab from hammer. Um, what about for the trigger of the Taurus firearm? The DNA test results for the swab from trigger produced a partial profile which is consistent with the reference sample of the suspect. Therefore, Carly Gregg is not excluded as a possible DNA donor to this sample. Ashley Smiley is excluded as a possible DNA donor to this sample. So explain that because, uh, you know, when I first read one of these reports, I was like, what does that mean, not excluded? Uh, in, in layman's term, I'd say that's them. But in scientific terms, you have to say that they can't be ruled out, right? Right. So, so in this case, the DNA that is there, it, it does match to Carly Gregg's DNA. Um, is there a quantification? Do you put a certain number, like one in so many people that that DNA belongs to? Uh, so anytime there is a, a match made, we do give a stat statement. And um, I can read that one and then explain it to you. Uh, for the eight markers compared, the genetic profile for the DNA donor of the swab from trigger occurs with a frequency of approximately one in greater than 10 billion random unrelated persons of the Caucasian, African-American, and the Hispanic population. 
And so that, that step is it's supposed to give weight to how common or how rare you would expect that profile. And in this case, it would be a rare profile. And as I understand it, the one in 10 billion, 10 billion is actually just the forensic laboratories cut off. You got to stop it at a certain point. That's right. Um, once the numbers get so big, it, it's, it's hard to understand. We usually cap it at above the world population, uh, which is uh, last time I checked around 8 billion. So we cap it at 10 billion. Uh, and to be clear, your report excludes Ashley Smiley as a DNA donor on the trigger of the gun. That's correct. Court's indulgence. No further questions, Ron. Cross examination. No questions. May this witness be finally released by the state? Yes, sir. By the defense? Yes, sir. You're free to go. Please leave your exhibits up there. The state yeah. may call this next witness. The state calls Felicia McIntyre. Yeah, he, they don't have. They We're not going to waste time. Asking them questions from the defense. <laughs> All right, we got Whitehead on, and he is speaking for the forensic crime lab. And the prosecution is examining him because it is still their case. Here we go. Gentlemen, what you guys do over there? Uh, we provide forensic examinations to eight law enforcement agencies in the state of Mississippi. She looks bored. And what is what is your position at the Mississippi Forensics Laboratory? I'm a forensic scientist as well as the uh, section chief of the trace evidence section, the supervisor. And what exactly does a section chief of tra trace evidence do? Um, we do items of trace evidence, gunshot residue, hair fibers, paints, glass, fire debris. Um, we have probably $1.5 million worth of analytical equipment, um, as well as I'm the supervisor of that section responsible for the technical aspects of the trace evidence section. And <clears throat> how long have you been employed there with the Mississippi Forensics Laboratory? I've been with the laboratory since January of 94, so a little over 30 years. Do you have any previous experience um, testifying as a forensic scientist and with a subspecialty of trace evidence? Yes, ma'am. I've testified uh, probably north of 400 times in circuit court in Mississippi, circuit court in Louisiana, as well as federal court in the state of Mississippi. Um, state of Mississippi. As a matter of fact, I've uh, testified here on several occasions. And if you could give the ladies and gentlemen just a kind of background on what education you have and kind of how you got to be in this role. Yes, ma'am. Um, I hold degrees in chemistry and forensic science from the University of Mississippi. Um, I've attended numerous schools and seminars over the years. I've been to uh, the FBI Academy in Quantico, uh, several different classes. I've been to McCrone Research Institute in Chicago. I'm certified by the American Board of Criminalistics after passing the uh, certification, national certification test in 1998. Uh, so my certification is in uh, comprehensive criminalistics. I'm also a member of the American Academy of Forensic Sciences, the Southern Association of Forensic Scientists, and the American Society. They always have to give, uh, yeah, he is definitely qualified for this, but guys, Look at him. I don't know. He kind of looks like the bad guy in Game of Thrones. Who was What was the guy with the with the dogs? And he was like the uh, bastard son of um that other guy. I don't I don't remember everybody's names, but he looks like an older version of that guy. I know it's irrelevant. But hey, it's early in the morning. I'm still waking up. I look like I just woke up, <laughs> but I've been up. Um, but yeah, they always have to hammer home how much uh, education they've got. Yeah, they have to because the defense will get up and go, yeah, he don't know doodly squat. Why do you got him up here? But anyway, the only reason why I stopped is because I'm looking at this guy and I'm like, he looks familiar and he looks like that guy. Okay, there you go.
the bad guy in Game of Thrones that everybody was glad when uh, the dogs ripped him apart. It was epic. Society of Trace Evidence examined. Uh, and of course our laboratory is an accredited laboratory. We're accredited by uh, the uh, organization called ANAB. Uh, your time, uh, Your Honor, at this time we would move to have this witness uh, tendered as an expert as a forensic scientist with uh, a specialty in trace evidence. Do you wish the board to witness? Without objection, he'll be admitted as an expert witness in the field of forensic science with specialty in trace evidence. You may proceed. Mr. Whitehead, if you could explain to us exactly what trace evidence is. Uh, trace evidence deals with a small items of evidence, um, trace amounts. Uh, we analyze such things as, as I previously stated, um, hairs, textile fibers, paints, glass, gunshot residue, and uh, in addition to that, fire debris type evidence where we're looking at charred debris for ignitables. Uh, we do a lot of comparison work where we're comparing unknown samples to known samples but probably our biggest caseload is gunshot residue examinations. Uh, we probably get about four or 500 of those uh, cases in a year. Uh, and our second most uh, caseload is gonna be fire debris. The hell? And <clears throat> what is uh, gunshot residue? Uh, gunshot residue is produced when a weapon is discharged and what'll happen is you'll get gases escaping any opening in the weapon. Uh, we're specifically looking for primer residue which comes from the primer cup so when the firing pin strikes in the in the weapon strikes the ammunition the, the primer cup it ignites those components. Uh, that ignites the gunpowder which is what propels a projectile out the end of the barrel. Uh, you'll get these gases escaping any opening in the barrel when it hits the cooler air outside the weapon, it'll condense into particles. These particles are microscopic in size. Uh, they contain lead, barium, and antimony, and they will have a spherical morphology. And what type of testing, or can you describe for us how you test for gunshot residue? Uh, we utilize what is called a scanning electron microscope with an energy dispersive x-ray analyzer. That's a fancy name for a uh, large microscope that uh, analyzes these tiny particles since they're um, about a micron in diameter you have to have a pretty powerful instrument to look for these. The microscope actually visualizes the particles, the x-ray detector actually tells us the composition of those particles and again we're looking for lead, barium, and antimony particles. Uh, those are what are produced uh, uh, from primer residue. And I want to take just a step back. You mentioned earlier that the lab is accredited. Um, do you also undergo like performance testings on the machinery that you use? Uh, we're accredited every four years. So every four years, uh, a team comes in and inspects all aspects of the organization, uh, as well as we're proficiency tested every year. So every year we complete proficiency tests uh, that are outside proficiency tests and we to, to look for things like gunshot residue or the other disciplines. And for <clears throat> gunshot residue, I flew, I guess it's been about 15 years or so. I, you know, I get years mixed up when I went to, flew, uh, flew home to sp spend some vacation with my parents, obviously before they had, my parents are passed away now. But um, I'm in line. You know, waiting to go through the gate because after 9-11, you can't just go to into the terminal anymore and nobody can go with you. Remember how people used to go with you and sit, wait till the plane came and then you'd just go get on the gate and then they leave? Well, now, you know, and, and remember when you could smoke? <laughs> anyway, um, so I'm in line waiting to show my ID. Amazing enough, you got to show your ID to uh, get on a plane, but you, you don't have to to vote. Democrats drive me crazy. Anyway, so I'm waiting in line. And I I noticed this security guy pacing back and forth looking at everybody in the line. It was a, not too big of a line, but a decent-sized line. And I looked over at him, and 
I'm just noticing he's just making eye contact with me, and he's just going. I'm like, this is creepy. Well, lo and behold, I go show my ID. It's my turn. He comes up and pull. They they pull me, and they want to search me. They searched my suitcase before it got on the plane. They searched my person. I had to stand up. I had to go through that thing. You put your arms out, and they wand you. They were doing all that, and then she said, okay, well, come over here, and they got these little pads, and they were swabbing my hands, and I was like, well, what are you doing? She goes, we're swabbing for bomb residue, or gut, whatever. They, they were swabbing for bomb materials. That's what she said, and I was like, are you kidding me? And she looked at me real serious. No, we take this very seriously. I was like, are you kidding me? So then they, they do it to my shoes. They take, I had me take my shoes off. They're, she's swabbing my shoes. And then she, she said, oh, they red flagged. They took me to another room. And I said, what's going on? She said, well, we found traces of uh, bomb residue on your shoe. I was like, what? And again, are you kidding me? I was getting pissed. Like, are you serious? So then, I, I mean, I was like, am I going to miss my plane? What's going on here? What are you going to do? What, what? You're telling me you found bomb residue on my shoelaces? Or my shoe? Whatever. So, I guess a long story short, she starts asking me some questions. She's like, well, did you use hand sanitizer? Did you wash your hands? I said, yeah, I showered. I washed my hands. Everything before, because it was in the morning, I'm flying for the afternoon, the morning afternoon, to, to get to where my folks live. I said, yeah, I used all that, of course. She said, so, okay, well, we're going to let you go, because it just it was a false positive. I'm just saying. But the defense is not going to be able to do that here. She clearly had the gun. But anyway, I thought that was interesting that he's bringing up... Uh, gunpowder residue and how they do the swab and they do all that where well I thought it was an interesting story anyway if you think so too but they they said I had bomb residue on my shoe I'm serious then when I get to my parents and real quick I open up my luggage and there's this yellow card in there telling me they searched it yeah they searched my luggage that it was going under the plane, you know, your 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 suitcase. And they searched it when I came back because I had a round trip ticket. There was another thing in there saying they searched my bag. It's like, okay. They wasted their time with me. I'm just saying. For people that are not familiar with those proficiency tests, is is that like I would do my research or, or my testing, I would submit my report, and an outside agency would then review everything and make sure that that was proper? Sort of like that. What we do is we, uh, the, the outside agency will produce the proficiency test. They have an expected uh, outcome of those tests, and uh, the report will be issued after the report is published on the, what that proficiency test is. So there is an expected answer um, back to this in, test. Back in, excuse me for speaking of you, back in March of two, uh, 2024 through currently, was the uh, your proficiency testing at the crime lab and you're specifically up to date? Yes. As a matter of fact, I just completed a GSR proficiency test. Uh, Mr. Whitehead, did you have the opportunity to work on uh, Mississippi Crime Lab case number 24003524? I did. And who was the suspect in that case? Uh, the suspect was listed as being a Carly Griggs. And the work and the testing that you did on that case, was that also uh, reviewed by anyone else? It was. All of our uh, casework is uh, reviewed by a second examiner, and that particular examiner in this case was Jacob Birchfield. Uh, and did he agree with the results of your findings? He did. What evidence did you review uh, in, or did you receive uh, in order to do your testing? 
Um, I received a gunshot residue evidence collection, collection kit labeled as coming from Carly Gregg. Permission to print food insurance? Yes, ma'am. <coughs> Into what's previously been marked as Exhibit 43. Um, have you seen that item before? I have. This is the gunshot residue evidence collection kit. I can identify it by the crime lab case number, submission number on the barcode that was placed there by an evidence tech when it was received into the laboratory. I can also identify it by the green evidence seal that I placed after the analysis was complete with my initials and date across that seal. And being that that is still sealed, does that appear to be in the same or similar condition as when you uh, closed it? It does. Uh, and for what purpose did you review that piece of evidence? This item of evidence was uh, analyzed for the presence of gunshot residue. And did you uh, perform that testing to see I if did. there was gunshot residue present? Um, did you prepare a report with your findings in that case? Yes, ma'am. Permission to break switch, sir? Is that an accurate copy of your report? Yes, ma'am. This is a copy of the uh, certified report that I issued in this particular case. And that contains your findings? It does. And it bears your signature? Yes, ma'am. Your Honor, we'd ask that this be marked as the state's next exhibit. Any objection? No objection, Your Honor. They admitted S-51 to all purposes. Next question, was, was the gun residue positive? Yeah. How was the... I'm curious, how does the would, defense uh, cross-examine him? Explain, I know you've talked about what gunshot residue is and that you, you uh, tested that particular kit. If you could just walk us through uh, the testing on this particular item and what your findings were. Yes, ma'am. This particular kit contained two adhesive tape lifts labeled right hand and left hand. Uh, the adhesive tape lifts, the idea is if there's any residue on the surface of a person's hands, it will be picked up by the adhesive tape lift. Those samples were then placed into the scanning electron microscope and analyzed for the presence of gunshot residue. And I reported out the results of that analysis. And what were the results in this case? Uh, particles of gunshot residue were positively identified on the right hand, labeled as coming from Carly Gregg's, and the left hand, labeled as coming from Carly Gregg's. She and held the gun with two based hands. Based on your training and experience, is the results rendered reliable? Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. No further questions, Your Honor. Cross examination. Any yeah, questions of this witness, Your Honor? Yeah. May this witness be finally excused by the state? Yes, sir. By the defense? Uh, yeah, I was wondering how, why, how would he cross examine him like there was nothing to say? They know she did it, they even said it in the opening. But they're just trying to figure, give a reason why she did it. The dad, uh, drug abuse from her father to her, her, fa her real father abusing her, the medication. All of this, they're going to try to just chip away and try to minimize her sentencing. The next witness is another forensic expert on firearms, and her name is uh, McIntyre. And um, I believe it's going to be the last witness of day two. So let's see what she has to say about the forensics on the bullets. Firearms and toolbars identification. Tool bar identification. You proceed. Ms. McIntyre, if you could kind of talk to us about uh, what ballistics are. Okay. Um, the field of firearms examination has as its main concern to determine if a bullet or cartridge case was fired in a particular firearm. We're able to do that through class and individual characteristics. More specifically, when a gun is manufactured, some features of that firearm are determined by that manufacturer. Those are considered class characteristics. The caliber, um, the way that the firearm is rifled, so the number of lands and grooves that are put inside that barrel, 
Those are put there to help impart spin on the bullet, but those are determined by that manufacturer. Incidental to that manufacturing process, individual marks are left behind. So those are things that happen um, as a result of the machining processes or use and abuse over time that cannot be determined by the manufacturer. And those marks are unique to a particular firearm. I'm looking for both those class and individual marks on a microscope when I'm comparing these items. So I'm looking at a comparison microscope, which is just two regular stereo microscopes joined by an optical bridge. So I can see two different items through one field of view. So uh, in a case matter, we'll be looking for those class and individual marks on unknown items versus items I know were test fired from a particular firearm. When you talk about test firing, uh, what, where do you get the items that you use to conduct test firing? When a firearm is submitted to the laboratory, I will generate those knowns. So I'm making test fires. I'm getting reference ammunition that we have at the laboratory that has been purchased, and I'm firing it in the gun that has been submitted for testing. I do that in a water tank. Um, that's literally just a 12 foot deep tank of water that allows me to discharge the firearm, those individual marks are placed on it, and they're not affected at all by the water. So I can retrieve it to have intact knowns to compare to my unknowns. And I want to take a step back. Um, we spoke with two experts previously about uh, proficiency testing, and I, I want to make sure that you two, uh, Ms. McIntyre, have performed and uh, essentially passed your proficiency testing. Yes, the firearms unit also completes annual proficiency testing, which I have taken and passed this year. Uh, did you have the opportunity to be involved in crime lab number 24-003524? I did. And who was the suspect in that case? Suspect is listed as a Carly Gregg, spelled C-A-R-L-Y, last name G-R-E-G-G. -G. And the testing that you <coughs> performed, uh, was that reviewed by anyone there at the Mississippi Forensics Laboratory? Yes, it was. And did they agree with your results? They did. In preparation, uh, or at the conclusion of your testing, did you prepare a report with your findings? I did. May I approach the witness, Sharon? Ms. McIntyre, what I've handed you, does that appear to be uh, a true and accurate copy of the report that you prepared in this particular case? Yes, it does. Um, you mentioned that you use test firing ammo. Uh, may I approach the witness, Your Honor? I'm sorry, may I have that moved as state's next exhibit before I move on? Any objection to the report? Yeah, objection. Objection. The report will be admitted as S53 without objection. I'm handing you what's been marked uh, or has not been marked. Could you tell me what that is, please? Yes, for the record, I've been handed a test fire envelope that bears crime laboratory number 24-003524. I recognize this envelope as it bears the crime laboratory barcode with the case number and submission number. My initials are placed upon it when I created it, as well as a tape seal of my date and initials when I completed my examination of these items. Um, and does that, does that appear to be in a uh, unaltered form since you sealed that envelope? Yes, the seals are still intact. Your Honor, we'd ask that that be marked as the state's next exhibit. Any objection? No objection, May I approach the witness, Sharon? Yes, sir. I've handed you two items that have been previously marked as S1, uh, S41 and S42. Um, do you recognize, recognize both of those items as well? I do. And what are those? States Exhibit 41 is Crime Laboratory Submission 5 in the above mentioned case. Uh, this is a sealed plastic bag containing a manila envelope labeled bullet from brain. 
State's Exhibit 42 is Crown Laboratory Submission 4. I recognize my markings on this item as well. It is a sealed plastic bag containing a manila envelope labeled bullet from back of neck. One other item, Your Honor. previously been marked as S40. Um, you would take a look at that and tell me if you can identify that. States Exhibit 40 is Crime Laboratory Submission 6. I recognize the markings on the, the box here. This particular box contains uh, one Taurus revolver. I also recognize my inscription and the serial number that are on this revolver within the box. Ms. McIntyre, we've talked about the bullet removed from Ashley Smiley's neck. Uh, I'm sorry, the projectile. Um, the one removed from her brain, the 357 Taurus, and then the test fires um, that you used. Was there any other evidence that you relied upon in rendering your opinions in this particular case? No, ma'am. Um, and were you able to, can you walk us through what testing specifically was done on these items? Yes, sir. Uh, when I received the firearm, I worked up a general worksheet documenting those class characteristics that we spoke about. I then used the reference ammunition we discussed, test fired this particular firearm into the water tank, thus generating the test fires here in States Exhibit 55. I then took the test fires in States Exhibit 55 and compared those on a comparison microscope to both the projectile in States Exhibit 41 and the projectile in States Exhibit 42 to arrive at my conclusions about whether or not they originated from States Exhibit 40. And what was your conclusion? The projectiles in States Exhibit 41 and 42 were fired in the gun in States Exhibit 40. And based on your training and experience, do you consider the results that you did in this particular case to be reliable? Yes, ma'am. No further questions, John. May the witness be excused by the state? Yes, sir. By the defense? Yes, Your Honor. You're free to go. Thanks. Do you have any further witnesses? Yes, Your Honor. All right. Mr. Camp, can you approach? Can I'll approach real quick. I believe that's going to be the last witness for day two, but... And concluding day two, um... Obviously, I, th I believe this will be part four for me of uh, going through this. <coughs> so, having rested its case in chief, it's about 4.50 in the afternoon. I'm going to release you for the evening, uh, but I'm going to remind you, you're not to talk about this case. You're not to watch any news accounts of this case. You're not to get on social media. Does everybody understand? All right, I'm going to need you back in the jury room tomorrow morning, 8.45, ready to go. All right? Everyone, please remain seated while the jury exits. Did he just say that the, the prosecution rested? I don't know. Maybe I miss her. He's just rest for the day. I don't know. But so far, wrapping up day two, I the defense is trying to establish some kind of groundwork and build on the body cam footage. Did, did, did they turn off their body cam? What's the procedure of the body cam? They were attacking that, but with no avail. I mean, I thought it went nowhere. There was 10 people with cameras, the, the one of the, right, the well, detectives said. Outside the presence of the jury. Motion by the defense. Let's hear this. Response. Your Honor, the... Uh, State believes that we've certainly met our burden beyond reasonable doubt that Carly Gregg is in fact the person who murdered Ashley Smiley, yeah. attempted to murder Keith Smiley, and the one that tampered with physical evidence by removing the security surveillance footage uh, and hiding it in the refrigerator. We'd ask that that motion be denied. Any further reply by the defense? No, Your Honor. All right. The motion for direct verdict must be viewed in the light most favorable to the non moving party, which is the state of Mississippi. The uh, court would state that uh, based on the uh, evidence that has been produced, the state of Mississippi has made a prima facie case, and this case will go to the jury. All right. 
anything further from the state for the evening? Your Honor, uh, we will likely have a motion in limine regarding the defendant's expert that I think we'd like to take up before he takes the stand tomorrow, just based off of our rulings from the court and things that he may or may not have considered. All right. Why don't we do this last Friday? I think that the court's ruling was that the witnesses were limited to testifying about the things that they had produced previously in discovery. Uh, upon further review of his report, he mentions things that are outside of that. Um, and so we're not necessarily uh, requesting a Daubert hearing as to his ability to render testimony as a forensic psychiatrist, but uh, in fact, to limit the information that he may or may not be able to talk about. All right, can we go on ahead and can we take a five minute recess and then at least let the court hear this so I can think about it overnight. Um, I don't like to make snap decisions if, if necessary. Yes, sir. All right, any objection to that by the defense? I mean, no, you're not this is the first we're hearing about this, so we have no idea what they're talking about. Okay, well, that's why we should go on ahead and hear it now. Yes, sir. Let's do this. Let's take a five minute recess. Uh, everybody can go to the restroom, then we'll meet right back here. I'd like to go on ahead and at least flesh this out as much as possible. Thank All you. Right. We'll be in recess five minutes. Make your motion in limine. motion in limine is the fact that he used as a source of information a video interview with Heath Smiley from August the 31st for 90 minutes um, when we had a zoom call with Dr. Clark he said that that nor his interview with Miss Gregg was recorded and so at this point we have no way of knowing what Mr. Smiley conveyed to him and how much of that he relied upon uh, in his interview that wasn't turned over to us prior to uh, August the 30th and then additionally Dr. Clark rendered some opinions um, of some sort and says and I'm looking at page 29 of his report your honor um, do you have a copy of that the report I have is only 24 pages 24 I'm sorry 24 I'm sorry Okay. Um, in that first paragraph on the last page, he says, it's my opinion that the Lexapro that she began taking clearly worsened her pre-existing psychiatric disorders, leaving her in a highly precocious state. But there is inadequate information available to attribute a direct ca casualty to the medication. And we believe that that would certainly, he cannot testify. His opinion is that he cannot say that the medicine caused her to behave in any way and so we do not think it would be proper for him to be able to take the stand and to discuss that Whoa. when in fact he says himself that he cannot attribute it to the medication. Uh, we'd ask that he be limited in that he not be able to talk about the Lexapro uh, and or since he did not reference it in this part, uh, the Zoloft um, that <clears throat> Ms. Gregg had allegedly taken at some point and any cause or connection to her state of mind at the time of the murder, attempted murder, and tampering. All right. Let me, let me ask this. As I recall, what the court was faced with was several late discovery disclosures, and the maybe the expert had not been retained until long after, until a few days after the discovery deadline. However, uh, I believe I gave the state a continuance, or, or I said, I went into the box procedure, all right? Yes, sir. Uh, did you have an opportunity to interview Dr. Clark? We had a Zoom conversation uh, where Mr. Kent was present, where we asked him about um, the sources that he relied upon um, asked him if he had relied upon any interview with Miss Vicki Breland. He said he had an interview with her, but it was not referenced in her report. And so he said he did not, um, he must not have relied upon her interview. Um, he said that 
Heath Smiley's Zoom recording interview uh, was, I'm sorry, Zoom interview was not recorded and that no one else was present. Um, and Your Honor, we asked him uh, somewhat about what his standard was. Uh, we cleared up the fact that both he and Mr. Camp had said that they would not be talking about an involuntary intoxication. And so Mr. Camp stated that on the record. Uh, he, Dr. Clark said, well, I, I talk about the medicine, but I'm not saying that's a legal standard about involuntary intoxication. And so judge, I, I think it's improper when he says for, he cannot render an opinion. Mr. Camp said he's not gonna talk about involuntary intoxication. So it would just serve to confuse the jury rather than offer any probative value at this point. Anything further? No, no Sarah. I'll try to get the medication in, guys. Yeah, I'm not a hundred percent understanding what 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 she's. Uh, um, the last paragraph says, in Carly's case, in my opinion, the Lexapro that she began taking clearly worsened her pre-existing psychiatric disorders. Y'all want that part in? Yeah. So I, and I think it's part. He's and, and I think and they they ask him about it. He's not saying. I think it's part of the whole his diagnosis of what he did but it is not saying that's what it what it was if i if i gather it right your honor but the next the the, the, the comma so to speak is but there is inadequate information available to attribute a direct causality to that medication yes and that's, that's what he's gonna huge. that is my understanding is he's gonna say there's not a direct uh showing that that's what that that she that that specifically caused it that is these other things you're on he's a four and, and also this is one thing i would say you put down a you you told us that we had to have this done by last friday you gave them an extension to go over this they talked to the our doctor our expert um they said they're not gonna have a daubert hearing which is what this what this is and then all of a sudden well, the afternoon it, before. Well, hold we, on, that, 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 that's not a Daubert hearing. A Daubert hearing is on his qualifications, uh, and on, and on the side. All, right. All right. Any further response? No, Your Honor. Reply. Your Honor, again, just that we believe the motion in limine is proper, as this statement and any testimony about this would would fly in the face of 403 there's no probative value and it would prejudice the defendant uh, and at this point it's not relevant and we would ask that the court exclude any testimony by dr clark or any ex uh, any other witness at this point about uh trying to causally relate lexapro to anything that happened on march the 19th 2024. court is in a uh, course in a bad position. The court would agree with the state that this statement in and of itself does not rise to the to, to the level that an expert is required to testify to in this state. However, whether he's saying it's not causally related or not, whether or not he, he's saying there's in a, inadequate information available to attribute a direct, a direct causality to that medication. It is an unwritten rule in the case law of this state. There seems to be two separate standards of law without the appellate courts ever stating that. There's one standard that the state is held to. And I would point out that pathologist was not called in this case because it was disclosed late. So I read the motion. You asked me to treat you like the state. Do you really want 
that. The state is free to cross appeal this court's decision, and it probably should. However, this court has little faith that uh, this court excluding a witness, even though he was disclosed, hired far past the discovery deadline. And even though the vast majority of the opinion appears to be improper, um, diminished capacity type evidence, and even though it does not rise to the standard, the court's going to overrule the state's objection. Courts and trial courts in this state are in a bad position. There are too many reversals when we exclude what is deemed to be the defendant's case. And I'm just going to be frank that the, the, this is not a case uh, that this court wants to see again. However, the defendant is raising an insanity defense, and that opens the doors wide open to a lot of things. Um, the court is going to overrule the state's objection. I'm going to allow the expert to testify to a late disclosed report that basically talks about diminished capacity and does not make the standard of care, does not make the burden of proof required in the state. However, it's all in the defendant's favor. I hope the state cross appeals. If there's a verdict in this case, I'm inviting you to cross appeal. I'm inviting the Supreme Court to tell me I'm wrong. Uh, give us some case law. It says I should, ex I, I, I'm okay excluding it, but there's too many cases out there that have been on the edges that they will reverse. Um, I'll be frank, there would be an opinion that came down and said, well, it's substantial. It came close enough. So uh, for those reasons, I'm going to deny it. Uh, if, if a jury chooses to return an NGRI on this evidence, then, then that's going to be their decision. Uh, if they choose to acquit her on this evidence, that, that's their decision. But I'm going to allow the uh, expert to testify and the state can deal with this on cross-examination to the best of its ability. Feel free to cross a bill, uh, regardless of verdict. Regardless of verdict, feel free to cross a bill. Um, I'm stating I believe I'm wrong, <laughs> uh, but I'm wrong in the defendant's favor. All right, that's going to be the ruling of the court. Anything further from the state? Your Honor, just, uh, and, and we can address this if necessary, but we might uh, have a similar argument after he testifies as with regards to jury instructions. Uh, just ask the court's permission to flesh that out if, if and when this expert testifies. All right. Got witnesses for 845 tomorrow, correct? Yes, Your Honor. Yes, Your Honor. All right. Uh, doctor's going to be here tomorrow, correct? Yes, Your Honor. All right. Is there anything further for the court to uh, deal with by the state? No, sir. By the defense. Uh, no, Your Honor. May we approach? Yes, ma'am. It's only like two minutes left. Wow. I, I think he's right. I mean, because he don't want to see this again. And if they they consider it which I don't think they're going to because when she cross-examines him the prosecution on saying hey you just said you, you there's no evidence of a correlation between her taking that drug and her losing her mind when there's we'll enough in her body morning. to go uh, and have the defendant over here dressed out please around 8 30 okay all right we'll ask the attorneys to be here at 8 30 and we I will mean, be to, in recess uh, till tomorrow morning I mean, she pleads insanity at the moment. Yeah, I figured. Well, you got heat of passion, insanity at the moment, and then they're going to try to attribute it to the medication, which, you know, I figured that's what they were going to try to do anyway. Medication, plug away at the 
forensics and all this other crap. Uh, well, not the forensic, but um, they kept bringing up the body cam and this other crap, which the defense. But I figured the only thing they've got is when they their case goes to them, it's to talk to psychiatrists and, and people about the medication. I mean, that's that's the only thing they can do. Temporary insanity because of medication. But this doctor is saying, no, I can't, I can't, uh, I can't say it did it. It cost it. He doesn't have any data. And I was curious about that. So, I mean, I think it's good he did it because if she was found guilty and they didn't allow that in, that could be grounds for an appeal for her later too down the road so to lay it lay the chips where they may i think the, i think the prosecution is still still okay and still looking good because she can come after him and juries aren't stupid anymore i think most juries are pretty smart with with a decades of uh forensic shows csis and I think juries want that information. They want the, the the science. They want the forensics. They want to hear what the experts are saying. Whether it's it's a doctor on the medication or the psychiatrist or the guy talking about the forensics itself on DNA and whatnot. But anyway, this concludes day two. And we're going into day three with the defense at the helm this this case is just moving right along pretty fast but uh i'm looking forward to seeing uh the doctor and the uh the psychiatrist now why wouldn't he have filmed uh their conversation him and the in the stepdad uh, i'm curious about that they that they should have done that but anyway until Day three. Have a good one.